And we are back. Welcome back to the King's Report this Friday, December 15th, 2017. St. King reported live from the Chanigong Palace Studios with a rod of iron to all the kings and queens of the kingdom of God. Good morning, folks. It is 7.13 a.m. And we are joined with Mr. Leo Nepper, who is the CEO of Citizens Alliance of Pennsylvania, or CAP. CAP is a nonprofit organization founded to raise the standard of living of all Pennsylvanians by restoring limited government, economic freedom, and personal responsibility. Leo joined CAP after being the Pennsylvania State Director for Heritage Action for America, the political affiliate of the Heritage Foundation. He is a long li- lo- a lifelong, I'm sorry, Pennsylvania resident and longtime conservative activist. Leo has built grassroots networks to fight against abuses in Pennsylvania government, including the infamous midnight pay raise. He graduated from Penn State's Capitol Campus with his MBA and is a member of Beta Gamma Sigma, the International Honor Society for Business Students. Leo, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much for having me. It's wonderful to, to have you this morning on this very brisk and beautiful Pennsylvania morning. I'm sure you, uh, if you haven't stepped outside yet, it's below freezing, so you may want to wear your overcoat this morning. But um, let us know a little bit about CAP, well, how was it, uh, when was it founded, and how does CAP influence Pennsylvania politics? If you so um, CAP was founded in 2009 um, by actually a number of longtime conservative activists and donors in the state. Um, including uh, Matt Briette uh, from the Commonwealth Foundation, well, currently of uh, Commonwealth Partners, which is uh, Pennsylvania's free market think tank. Um, after uh, CAP was founded, uh, basically the reason that, that the organization got going, and this, this kind of goes into how we affect Pennsylvania politics, um, is that there really was no accountability mechanism um, focused on economic policy in the state, um, at least from a, from a conservative, um, you know, free market perspective. Mm. Um, and, and what I mean, what I mean by that is uh, most of the voices that um, were out there were talking about, you know, raising taxes and raising spending. Um, mm-hmm. And while there certainly were uh, business organizations who were focused on electing pro business candidates, one of the things they would not do is actually engage in primary challenges to get rid of anti-business candidates. Mm. Um, the, way Pencil- the way Pennsylvania's um, electoral districts are set up in many places, the only race is the primary election. Um, and then after that, you go to the general election, but the districts are fairly lopsided. So it doesn't really matter, um, mm. you know. Uh, who the candidates are in the general election, because one of them is going to win just based on demographics. Um, Mm. So basically we're an accountability mechanism. Um, What we will do through our political action committee um, is work to educate um, voters. We will also get involved in um, assisting candidates who are running for office, um, particularly the state house and the state Senate. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, our, Our focus is on state, you know, state politics pretty much exclusively. Occasionally we'll look at um, local issues if they have uh, statewide implications. Now, what are some of the most pressing issues in terms of Pennsylvania politics and economic policy in general? What are some of the main issues that we're dealing with as a state, uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Well, Pennsylvania actually has a fairly hostile business climate. Um, When Mm. you take a look at um, most surveys of CEOs and business leaders, um, Pennsylvania is in the bottom 10 in terms of states um, to business. Yeah, so it's not good. Um, That's terrible. Yeah, so there are several different areas that that really impact that one of them is uh labor policy pennsylvania is a uh, is not a right to work state we're a, a compulsory union state basically oh. um, if you oh, yes, yes. if you want to work again. 
Right. Um, we also have a lot of problems um, with our regulatory environment, um, and we see that particularly as it re- relates to uh, the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, oh, uh, yes, 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 right. And uh, all the regulation uh, depends on coal and fracking, et cetera, right? Yeah, and it's not just coal and fracking. Um, there's actually a lot of stuff as it relates to, I mean, just basic, um, you know, water runoff for construction projects. There, there, there are a lot of problems mm-hmm. for the way our regulatory and environment is structured. Um, I've, you know, mm-hmm. had conversations with, you know, business owners and um, some folks who do consulting for, you know, a variety of industries, and. Uh, there are, you know, businesses who will set up shop just over the Pennsylvania border in order to, you know, service Pennsylvania customers just because, you know, they can't get the permits that they need. Um, the oh, other issue that they run into is that the conditions um, that are on the permits will change um, kind of on a whim of whoever the inspectors are. Um, oh, my gosh. So wow. They, they could have they could have um, the, they can have things change kind of mid project and it, it increases their costs and it and you know businesses know that so they're mm-hmm. reluctant to make large scale investments in the state and as a result um, we we don't have the kind of dynamic economic growth that we need uh, um, and there are a variety of reasons for that but it, it, it's 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 really tragic because Pennsylvania, and we believe that um, Pennsylvania can really be the economic success story of the 21st century. Um, mm. We're within, uh, you know, an eight, eight hour drive of something like a third of the United States population. Um, right, right. We have, a tre- we have a tremendous level of natural resources. Um, and yes. we also have, you know, world-class educational institutions on both, you know, all over the state. So mm. we have the the um, the intellectual firepower, we have the resources, and we also have the location. The problem is that Pennsylvania government refuses to get out of the way. Wow! Again, the story with the government always getting meddling in the in the freedom of people's free interactions and you know free association. Let's break it down, just simplify it for us. And of course, a lot of our listeners understand, you know free markets, but of course, you're, you're very trained with a business degree, etc. Just break down, simplify, just, just in terms of generally, why are free markets better than, let's say, government regulated or centralized central planning markets, quote, central plan markets? Just let's go back to the basic, basic, basics. Explain to us uh, just a simplified version, if you could. Sure. Well, there are a couple of reasons why it's better. And the the reason that I go back to one of the the, the first reasons that it's better um, has to do with the fact that government doesn't actually have any resources of its own. Um, Yes. What people have to think about is, you know, when you when you talk to somebody and you ask them, you know, well, why do you pay taxes? Um, you know, they will oftentimes say, oh, well, you know, it's for roads, it's for, you know, fill in the blank, it's for my school district. But in reality, people pay taxes because government has a monopoly on the use of force. Um, yes. Government, yes. Ooh, ooh, ooh. government you know, funds itself through coercion. Um, if you don't pay your taxes, you go to jail. Um, so, mm. I mean, just from a, from a very fundamental um, you know, personal property rights issue, um, taxation is a legalized form of theft. Wow. Um, so that, I mean, I mean wow. just, just as a moral issue, um, it's mm-hmm. problematic. Well, the other issue IRS that you run, says that you're voluntarily paying for it, but paying the taxes, but if you don't pay it, they'll send a SWAT team to get you. <laughs> that, that. Um, so the other, the other issue that, that, you know, people tend to, to not think about or tends to get overlooked when it comes to centralized planning versus free markets is that um, depending on the level of centralized planning, really what you're, you're doing is you're saying that a small group of people um, have a better understanding of how to allocate resources than a large group of people. Um, 
if you kind of flip the argument on its head, it's it's basically saying that people aren't good enough. Uh, individuals are bad at um, determining how they spend their money. So what we need to do is give it to a group of smarter individuals, you know, quote unquote, smarter individuals, and they'll decide how to spend money. Um, <laughs> and and, we're, and right. So it, it assumes that, you know, government officials somehow have access to much better information or are able to make decisions in a more rational manner, um, which, you know, when you look at the evidence has, is, I mean, it's very lacking that that's the case. Um, you know, when we take a look at Pennsylvania has had kind of this um, central planning, um, picking winners and losers economic policy for the last hundred years and businesses, industries continue to leave the state um, and they aren't coming back into the state. Um, so you have these, you know, some businesses who are getting grants or special tax treatment really at the expense of their, you know, already existing in-state competitors. Um, right. So right. In, in a lot of, a lot of cases, you actually have businesses subsidizing the people that they're trying to comp they're trying to compete with via their taxes. Um, and it's just, that's fundamentally unfair. Um, and what, what we look at is the smartest way or the best way for businesses to thrive is for individuals and businesses themselves to have the ability to make um, make decisions that are in their own best interest. Um, and you have what ends up, uh, what is kind of uh, referred to as uh, spontaneous order. Um, it's kind of yes. the miracle of the marketplace. Right. You know, nobody, had, nobody has to decide, um, you know, how much a dozen eggs costs it's based on supply and demand um so those two things automatically just level out well so maybe because um, you mentioned, so just, oh, go, go ahead go ahead go ahead no 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 go ahead yeah it's amazing because you you mentioned also the unions and the the stranglehold that the unions have over pennsylvania uh, corporations here in, in uh, and of course that's m making them vote with their feet and leave the state I mean, explain to us some of the problems with having such uh, what uh, the, the, the union's power base that strong. I mean, doesn't it become in the end so, almost like a mafia? I mean, it's not, nothing inherently wrong with a union trying to fight for uh, workers' rights. But if they can get lobby for state power and they can even get subsidized from the state, isn't there a problem when they get too uh, uh, in deep with the with the um, with the state? Yeah, and that that actually uh, public sector unions in particular are very problematic. Um, I mean, to, to be polite about it, because what ends up happening um, is you have unions of public employees who then um, pool their money together in order to lobby the government to spend more money on their jobs. Mm. Um, they also will work through their own political action committees to elect. Um, basically to elect the people so they can sit on both sides of the negotiating table. Um, when it comes to contract negotiation, um, you know, elected officials should um, be advocates for the taxpayers and should really have our best interest at heart. But when you yes. look at the amount of money that public sector unions pour into getting people elected, um, Governor Wolf is a great example yeah. of that. And then you see the types of policies that um, those politicians advocate for. Um, it really um, it, it increases the costs for the rest of us, and that's one of the reasons that Pennsylvania has such a um, you know a bad tax environment. Well, it's amazing because whenever the whenever the uh, these unions or the or, or the uh, federal funded uh, organizations are trying to do. This or that, whether it be TI, TSA or even construction work, it's always slower, long takes longer. It's more arduous. They set up the system so they get paid by the hour and they extend extend the project time. They're always over overdue. And and, and what is it? And, and if you had a private company doing it, you would be able to get that done quicker, cheaper, faster, less less uh, interference with people's day lives. I mean, I think there was one private organization 
organization out in San Fran or California somewhere where they had just a test run of a private company doing the, um, the airport checks, uh, you know, in comparison to the TSA. The TSA couldn't, has an abysmal rate of being able to stop, uh, uh, you know, um, different contraband material, even in their own tests that they do on themselves. And this private company was able to be, it was faster. You don't get sexually molested and groped. You don't have a traumatic experience. I mean, I don't want to fly anymore because these, I don't know some person is going to be molesting me before I go on a plane or my children. I mean, it's like, it's totally nuts. But I feel the same way with like these, these a lot of these uh, union driven construction uh, or, or whatever it is that they're doing. It, it almost like the market, uh, the, the, the end user, the client, the, the, the citizen, we get a lesser product takes longer and it's more expensive, we have to end up paying and burdening all the costs. Yeah, and, and one of the things that, that it's kind of important to think about too, um, and, and this is a kind of a, a something that most people don't know about, is Pennsylvania actually has what's called the prevailing wage law. Mm. So um, what that means is any projects that are funded by taxpayer dollars um, state taxpayer dollars are actually forced to um, go by what they call prevailing wage, which really isn't a prevailing wage. It's kind of an average of union contract wages throughout the state. Um, mm. And because those union contracts are primarily centered in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, which are higher cost of living areas, um, the the wage rates are actually higher um, than they would otherwise normally be. Um, just kind right. of as a practical example, there was a school down in York, um, in the York County area, so southern Pennsylvania, southern central Pennsylvania, um, that was working on um, having a roof put on. Um, and what ended up happening was um, they got their bid, um, you know, they got some bids in, and then they took the bids to their solicitor, the school lawyer, and the lawyer looked at it and said, look, you didn't bid this at prevailing wage. You have to go back out and, you know, um, get a bid at the, the prevailing wage. And what ended up happening was it almost doubled the cost of the project. Oh, my goodness. They made them tear it down and then build it again? No, no, no. They didn't have to build it again. They, 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 they didn't start the project. Um, so this, I, see, I, still, right, right. I mean, it was... It, so, so wow. they have to pay almost twice as much for the same product. Um, no different. Same, it was actually the same company um, that they went back to to get the, the, you know, the same companies put in their bid that it ended up, you know, costing them twice as much. I mean, folks, that is a big deal. Think about it. You may think it's another company that's getting hit with this, you know, twice the cost issue. But think about it. If you have to pay twice the cost for milk, you have to pay twice the cost for your gas. You have to pay twice the cost for your car. You have to pay twice the cost for your home insurance. Think about how devastating that would be for your lifestyle, your life in general. How are these businesses to survive? Survive. We're going to take a short break and we're going to go over it when we get back with the candidates that are coming up for governor. What are the strengths and witnesses? Of course, the uh, Governor Wolf and what's up with him. We will be right back with Mr. Leo Netberg, CEO of Citizens Alliance of Pennsylvania. We'll see you right after this break. Stay with us. fun shooting this Tommy gun today? It's always fun shooting Tommy guns. This one especially, it's just absolutely gorgeous. All polished and, and chromed up. It's, 
it really looks like a million bucks. Yeah, yeah. Elliot Ness would have loved one of those. Yeah, and it's available right now in, the, in your favorite dealer, and you go yeah. pick one up. Yeah, just have him call your distributor. I mean, the, the gun, you know, was initially made way back when, back in the 19, I guess, 27, is this one. Yeah, model but 27. I was surprised by how quick it knocked down those plates. Oh, three and a half second run, under three and a half second run, knocking down a plate run. 341. I mean, the, gu the gun is heavy. It's about, yeah. what, 12, 14 pounds, especially with this drum, but it's surprisingly surprising how quick you can go with it. It, yeah. it would actually make quite a good self-defense rifle at home. If I climbed in somebody's window and they were aiming that at me, I think I'd get out of there real quick. So <laughs> That sounds the, about right to me. Just the intimidation factor alone. Fire! Car Arms. Magnum Research and auto ordinance. The Car Firearms Group. With a diverse product line that blends American craftsmanship with cutting edge technology. It's no secret why gun enthusiasts choose Car Firearms Group. From the Desert Eagle and Baby Desert Eagle made famous by Hollywood. The history of the 1911 and the Tommy gun. To the best in compact concealed carry. Car Firearms Group is not only the first name in personal defense, it's a name that has earned the respect of gun enthusiasts around the world. Concealment, innovative technology, value, accuracy, and history. Car Firearms Group, made in the USA. Visit car.com today. Hi, I'm Joby Gorgas with Magnum Research. I'm here to tell you a little bit about our new L5 and 44 mag. Uh, this is our five inch model, lightweight model. Uh, it's got an aluminum grip frame, uh, shaving down the weight so that we can get it under 50 ounces so that it's New York legal. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how to properly hold the L5 for function. When shooting a Desert Eagle, you wanna make sure that your dominant arm is locked out pushing back into the back of the grip. Your, your secondary hand is holding around the front of the grip to keep the muzzle flip down. Uh, this gives you a good firm hold for proper cycling. Uh, we got to remember that the Desert Eagle is a gas operated rotating bolt semi-automatic pistol, uh, not unlike an AR system. I also want to talk to you about the stance for shooting the Desert Eagle. Uh, when shooting the Desert Eagle, you need a good firm base. So you want to step into your direction Get that arm locked, that support hand on, and lean forward into it so that you can handle that recoil. And welcome back, kings and queens of the kingdom of God. Second King reporting live from the Chani Hugung Studios. Joined here with CEO of Citizens Alliance of Pennsylvania, uh, Mr. Leo Nepper. Leo, we were talking during the break about the incredible uh, race in Alabama and Trump initially uh, supporting Luther Strange. Eventually, uh, Roy Moore became the top player there. Uh, uh, and uh, unfortunately couldn't, couldn't win, but the establishment seemed to be so much against him. Uh, Mitch McConnell was spending tons of money against him as well. Are we going to see something similar like that in Pennsylvania? Who are the candidates that are running this time for governor, uh, if you could, and break some of that down for us? That down for us. 
Sure. Um, so there are at this point four candidates running uh, for governor. Um, there's a woman named Laura Ellsworth, uh, Paul Mango, and uh, Speaker of the House Mike Terzai. Uh, the three of them are from the Pittsburgh area. Um, there's also uh, Senator Scott Wagner, who is from York County. Um, to give you some kind of basic background on all of them, um, Laura Ellsworth, uh, she's an attorney, um, originally from New York, has a law degree from uh, Pitt University. Um, so I was in, in doing some, uh, she's actually the candidate I know the least about, um, is she's been very involved in philanthropic, uh, so charitable causes out in uh, the Western Pennsylvania area. Um, not as much involved politically. Um, it's kind of odd because I was going through and just kind of doing some basic research and looking at press clippings and everything uh, about her in particular. Um, and I'm not sure who she's targeting um, or who the electorate she's targeting in the Republican primary actually is. Um, you know, according to her own statements and some records and everything that I kind of found, uh, she says that she wrote in John Kasich for president. Um, and over the course of the years, um, I went through, and one of the best things to do is if you want to learn about a candidate is look to see how they're, you know, or how they're spending their money. Um, who have they given candidate? to politically? Oh, my past. gosh, that's terrible. <laughs> So, oh my so in, in looking at who who she has kind of given uh, money to politically over the course right. of the years, she's actually right. given money to Obama, Clinton, oh Bob Casey, gosh. and Arlen Specter. So, oh yeah, and she's God. running for the, the nomination of the Republican Party. It smells like a wolf in sheep's clothing to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I think that she's she's probably. She probably ha believes, you know, that that in in she probably has some personal principles that she believes in, but I don't necessarily think that they line up based on you know kind of who she has supported politically. I don't think it necessarily lines up in any way, shape, or form with with you know, kind of free market policies, limited government policies. Right. Um, right. So now you know that um, I know this, Wagner well, and Mango are they the are they the ones that are really the most people the, I hear most buzz, buzz about them. Mango is also a former paratrooper, a Navy SEAL, or something like that. Yeah, um, Mango is a uh, let's see, he was a West Point graduate. Um, he's also Harvard educated. I'm not. He was, I believe, a paratrooper. Uh, I'm not sure what his military service actually looked like, but he definitely he was in the the military service. Um, he was a, um, a healthcare consultant for McKinsey and Company. Um, McKinsey and Company is kind of an international consulting firm, and they will go out and help companies kind of uh, like restructure um, and also find solutions to internal problems that maybe they hadn't previously considered. Um, so he specialized in, in healthcare. Now, for what I can find, he actually. Um, he, he definitely sounds, uh, fairly conservative when he talks, um, particularly on social issues. Um, I have not heard kind of the same level of, um, passion about free market economics. Um, mm. so, um, and, and just kind of, again, kind of going back to that, where are they putting their money? um question um you know mr mango has not or was not particularly involved in pennsylvania state politics um in any discernible way over the years um the only exception to that was in 2006 he made a uh, thirteen thousand dollar donation to lynn swan who was a republican candidate for governor um it appears that he has been more involved with um supporting federal candidates um, candidate uh, like he was a supporter financially of Tom Cotton and Ben Sass, um, who are you know fairly con who are you know pretty conservative. But at the same time, he's also donated financially to Mitch McConnell. Um, in oh. 2016, yeah, in 2016, he made contributions to Bush, Rubio, and Trump. 
Um, he made his contributions to Trump after he had secured the nomination. He actually gave $25,000 to uh, Jeb Bush Super PAC. Oh, my um, goodness. Are you kidding me? Oh, that's bad. No. So that's just, I mean, just to, to kind of lay the groundwork for, for that one. Um, Are there any, anybody so, that is involved in the gubernatorial race that actually supported Trump from the beginning? That was, uh, uh, you know, pushing for Trump's agenda? Um, you know, I think I would have to double check, but I think that Scott Wagner was probably the earliest supporter of Trump. Mm. Um, Interesting. But I, I, I mean, I can't say that with any degree of, of certainty, but I know that he was involved. Um, so just for, for background and full disclosure, Scott was actually, Senator Wagner was actually one of the first donors involved in our organization. This was prior, so this was back in 2010, back before he looked at running for office at all. Mm. Um, so, so I have known Scott for quite an extended period of time. Um, so I have a, a very good, you know, kind of understanding of who he is. Hey, I don't always agree market, with him. But... The government, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's definitely uh, a more free market, fiscally conservative kind of guy. He's a numbers guy. Um, so when he is having conversations with um, department heads and everything, he sits on the, the finance committee um, in the state Senate. So when he's having conversations with people, he wants to know where the money is going and make sure that it's actually being spent appropriately. Um, and Scott, um, so in, for a little bit of background, um, Scott uh, decided to run a write-in campaign for the Pennsylvania Senate. Um, I want to say it was 2014. Um, and he, he did that basically because the, there was some, uh, electoral shenanigans that happened. There was a, a, a incumbent who retired early. Um, a state house member with a spotty record was kind of chosen by the party establishment to run. And Scott thought that he would be more conservative and a better, you know, better fit for his district. So, mm. um, for the first time in Pennsylvania history, we had someone who ran a write-in campaign actually be elected to the state Senate. Um, Interesting. It's, it's never, so that has never happened before. And he actually had um, Tom Ridge and Tom Corbett both, you know, working against him in the, in the, uh, in that effort. Um, wow. Once he got, yeah, once he got to the Senate, he actually orchestrated the, um, I guess, overthrow of a couple members of the Republican uh, leadership in the Senate because they were too yeah. closely aligned with public sector unions and other kind of big Ooh. government special interests. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, um, yeah, that's pretty good. good. Um, yeah, so, so Scott, I mean, I've, I've known him for, for years. Um, well, it's interesting. He's, also, he's someone... And Steve Bannon seems to be indirectly supporting. I think I mentioned that during the break. Uh, but there was an article out of Allentown about, you know, the cordial relationship between Bannon and, 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 and Wagner that they met on a plane and he liked his ideas and he said, hey, he's a good guy. He seems like a good guy. And Breitbart then replayed, you know, re, uh, posted that article uh, showing their sort of indirect, you know, t uh, 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 you know support. Um, so it seems like, you know, people who are very hardcore free market people like Bannon are more excited about somebody like a Wagner than about somebody like a, like a, like a mango or, or some of the other uh, candidates. Yeah. And, and I think what you will find, um, Senator Wagner has really been a very um, outspoken critic of um, organized labor and other various, you know, kind of far left causes. Mm. Um, what you would see is if he were the nominee for governor, this would very quickly become almost a national race um, wow. because, you know, left, you know, left of center, far left organizations would pour money into the state to keep Scott out of office. But you mm. would also see uh, more conservative, um, you know, you're, you're both, you know, kind of fiscally conservative, you're. Um, I guess your your Steve Bannon kind of strain of the the Republican Party organizations and people like that would probably come in, um, you know, in a big way uh, in order to support um, a candidacy of uh, for for Scott Wagner. 
Um, wow. He also, as far as I can tell, um, has has been the most successful in terms of um, fundraising for his gubernatorial campaign. Um, part of that is that he put um, four million dollars of his own money into the gubernatorial campaign last year, um, wow. and none of none of the other candidates have, have you know have any um, filed financial disclosure forms. Um, so it's kind of hard mm. to piece together information about them. Um, from what I understand, both Paul Mango and Laura Ellsworth have the ability to um, engage in some level of uh, self-finance for their campaigns. Um, but I'm not sure what that looks like in terms of how much, you know, how much money they're actually able to put in. Um, and then the other candidate who we really haven't talked about yet uh, is uh, the current Speaker of the House, Mike Terzai. Um, Speaker Terzai um, has been in office oh, at least a decade. Um, I remember when I first got started in 2005, he was you know, already in the House. And um, he has, you know, kind of looking at his past history, um, he has become a recent convert to fiscally conservative causes. And I mean, I'm, I, I'm always Ooh. suspect of people so i take a look at you know what they're doing versus what they're saying um, right, 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 right. over the years uh over the years mike Terzai has worked for billions of dollars in corporate welfare um and he's also in 2013 he voted for tom corbett's gas tax hike that gave pennsylvania the highest you know gas taxes in the oh country. my goodness so unbelievable um, historically when i when i looked at um Speaker Terzai's ability to raise money. Um, he has come in at about $2 million as, as probably the top end of what he has raised um, in an election cycle. Um, and as Speaker of the House, I'm sure he actually has the ability to raise some uh, uh, additional funds um, just because of contacts that he's made and, and people that he, you know, has met over the course of the years while he's been in office. I'm sure he has the ability to raise additional money. Um, so, uh, I mean, we have, you know, a number, the, all of the candidates um, have the ability to raise money to what extent, you know, what, what exactly that's going to look like is important because when you're talking about a statewide race, you're talking about, you know, influencing people and, and the cost of that is, is in the millions of dollars. Oh, my goodness, it has a direct impact on all of us who reside here. Talk to us about Governor Wolf, um, the, you know, uh, man who receives funds from George Soros, a literal Nazi collaborator, a uh, literal uh, sort of villain of the modern day uh, that's responsible for so many democracies falling, funding the falls of democracies. Um, and and yeah. Wolf is receiving funds from him. Unbelievable. Yeah, and to be honest with you, <clears throat> I mean, looking at those, you know, those kind of things is important, but it's also really important to look at who the people are in the state of Pennsylvania that are that he's right. receiving money from. Yes, um, yes. His largest, uh, he, some of his largest campaign donors have been um, organized labor. Um, particularly mm. public sector unions, um, yep. the SCIU, um, the PSCA, the State Teachers Union, and the, uh -oh. the State Employees Union. Um, so he's gotten you know quite a bit of money from the people that he's supposed to be negotiating against um, when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to state contracts. Um, there's actually a lawsuit oh, um, against uh, one of his executive policies that enabled. Um, the SEIU in order to basically engage in a shadow unionization um, effort uh, for people who provide home health care. Um, so even if you are providing home health care for your own family member um, if, if, who has a disability, um, the governor is supporting an effort that would kind of make those people become um, members of a, of a labor union. I mean, that's so kind of weird. I mean, we know that like the governor is a, a hugely important role, but I almost feel like we've gotten this this trend where the citizens sort of believe that 
if we elect somebody else who's going to be like a savior that comes and swoops and solves all the problems, isn't it important also for the citizens to be activated and citizens to be involved in politics to take over their local councils and commissioners' offices, et cetera, and move the country back to its more sovereign and free market, you know, free market-based system, which the founding fathers, you know, bestowed upon us by the grace of God. Um, is it important for citizens to be to be activated and be active in local politics and not not only just focusing on uh, the voting booth? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and that's really one of the big problems that, that we run into when we're, when we're talking to people. Um, and, and to be honest with you, about most people um, spend about 90% of their energy trying to influence federal policy. Um, and federal oh. policy, you know, what's going on in Washington, D.C. is important. But people have a much better chance of influencing both state, you know, county and local politics um, than they do what's happening in Washington, D.C. You know, if you send an email to Nancy Pelosi, she doesn't care what you have to say. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and if and, and realistically, if, if even if you are sending if emails to Republicans. <laughs> right. Yeah, if she can remember who's in office. But, but realistically, the only people who, who are interested in your opinions are the people that you can vote for. So that would be your, yes. your, your congressman. That would be your two senators, um, the president to a certain extent. But, but as you get more local, um, so, you know, your, your state house, state senate, governor, county commissioners, you know, township commissioners or township supervisors, school board members, those are the people, you know, who you can really influence. Um, and, and when you take a look at the costs that people pay, the, a huge percentage of their, of their tax bill is coming from state and local sources. Um, right, you know, right, right. The, the, the issue of property taxes, property taxes are almost entirely your school district. Um, mm. Counties certainly mm. collect a portion of, of the property taxes as well, but it's a small portion. Um, right. So it's not it, it's not something that when you look at who which level of government impacts your life the most on a daily basis, it is easily the state and local government that does it. Whether we're talking about zoning regulations, as we were talking about earlier with environmental impact stuff. Um, for the Department of Environmental Protection. I mean, you need to go out. If you, um, you know, if your church or a local business wants to pave their parking lot, um, they have to spend, you know, ten to fifteen thousand dollars getting an environmental impact study done. Um, mm, so, right, I, I, right. I mean, there are a lot of costs associated with local government, um, and and some of those costs. You know, for for local and state government are dictated, you know, by what happens in Washington D.C. But a lot of those costs are really dictated by, you know, their their bad policies that they enact at the state and local level. Mm. So, in other words, what you're just saying is that people have a much more uh, uh, have much more power at a local level. However, for it's almost like it's like intimidating to work on a local level because you don't want to sour your reputation and I think people are intimidated in that factor or you know you don't want to get in fights on the local level that may affect your business whatever but that may be a short-term um, cost in the long run it's absolutely critical that patriots do get local control and take back their counties and take, take back their areas so that they can push you know for more uh, you know freedom uh, they can push for more um, uh, you know uh, fair environments and, and open environments where companies can flourish and, and business can flourish how much power does the local level actually have in your view can we actually for example push on a local level for let's say adding competition to the monopolistic you know uh, state-run education system so that you know our tax credits are going like the Sweden model. Our, we got tax credit and vouchers where we can, you know, our tax money is not only going to public schools, but going to private or charters or homeschooling, whatever the parents choose. How easy is that uh, to enact on the local level as opposed to the, of course, state or federal? Well, when, when you start talking about education policy and things of that nature, that really, is, is kind of centered at the state level. But even there, it's not as difficult as people would 
would think um, to influence policy. Um, uh, just to, to kind of give you an example, um, organizationally, you know, we've gotten involved in um, state house and state senate races since 2010. Um, in that time, we have helped to elect and reelect, you know, 20 members of the House and the Senate. Um, mm. uh, 21, actually. We have six in the Senate and 15 in the House. So, um, I mean, we are working um, organizationally towards, um, I mean, we have a goal of having 55 members in the House and 15 members in the Senate. Um, that way that, you know, we can really influence what the legislative agenda is, whether or not meaningful school choice legislation um, comes up on the floor, um, whether or not legislation to kind of roll back um, the, 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 or streamline the regulatory environment of the state gets taken up, how the state's bud how the state budgets the money that it already gets, you know, how local governments are able to interact with their citizens, you know, just a lot of that kind of broader policy um, mm. is, is, is something that we can, you know, that we can really work on. Um, and when you're talking about, you know, citizens interacting with their, their, you know, with their local government, um, you know, going to a school board meeting, if you take five of your friends to a school board meeting, you have doubled the attendance at a school board meeting. Um, right. I mean, it, it's just, you know, uh, and the same thing is true for, you know, when, when you're talking about, you know, your, your, your local government, um, township supervisors, uh, things of that nature. County government is largely the same way. It goes underreported and people don't pay as much attention to it. Um, you know, the, the lion's share of, as I had mentioned earlier, people's attention is in Washington, D.C., and that's the place where they have the least ability to influence policy. Um, well, you know, they're, I just they're most to just continue to pick your brain because you have so much knowledge about all the little details of Pennsylvania, which is so refreshing to hear, um, especially, you know, not only because you're, you're running this or the your Citizens Alliance organization, but you've been a resident here your whole life, et cetera. Um, how do people get in contact with you, support your work, um, learn more, learn more about uh, the candidates that are coming up? What's the best way to get to uh, your websites, et cetera? Well, our website is empowerpa.org. Um, and we have, uh, we do blog posts and, and things like that on the website. I would also suggest that people um, on our website are actually able to sign up for our email alerts. Um, usually about once a week, we'll send out an email to people to keep them posted about what's happening in Pennsylvania. Um, another resource that we have is uh, our Facebook page. Um, we're actually very active in social media. We have about 90,000 likes on our Facebook page. Wow. Uh, and we, we post articles pretty much on a daily basis, um, kind of news stories from across the state of Pennsylvania, as well as our own uh, original content from our website, um, really to keep people engaged and informed about what's happening at, a sta at the state level. Um, so either Facebook, wow. which you know, our page is just Citizens Alliance of Pennsylvania, um, and our website again is empowerpa.org. EmpowerPA.org, folks. Go sign up today. Get the newsletter. It's so important because we're talking many times about federal issues and we, everybody's on the Donald Trump you know, email list, et cetera. But again, we got to be focused on also in our state. We have to know what's going on in the state, who's running. And of course, at the local level, we have to be attending these supervisors meetings, these teacher association meetings, et cetera. We have to be involved. And that's how we make the positive change toward us as men and women made in the image of God. Thank you, Mr. Leo Anepper, for joining us today. It's been a great privilege to hear from you. I'd love to have you back on because you're just a, 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 an Einstein when it comes to uh, the breaking down uh, for you know uh, us more laymen about what's happening in, the, in Pennsylvania. Uh, again, that is empowerpa.org. Go check it out, folks. Get on the email list and, of course, support uh, the organization as you could. Thank you, Leo, for joining us today. We thank you all joining us this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful, brisk morning outside. If you're driving, if you're on your way in, 
Uh, make sure that you are bundled up nice and tidy. It's going to be snowing today. Hope you have a beautiful, blessed day. Give all the praise, glory to the one who has created it all. And we will see you tomorrow, 5 a.m. sharp, on the King's Report. God bless God's speed, and may his kingdom come.